So what are we doing today? Why are we here? Well, at the conclusion of this course, you, the student, will be able to identify what I2P is, identify one reason why we should block JavaScript, but we're going to talk about a couple in here, okay? Especially when you're using something like I2P. Uh, we're going to explain how I2P works, and then we're going to explain how I2P is a little bit different than Tor. Uh, during our previous talk, we talked about Freenet, and then we talked about how Freenet was a little bit different than Tor, and some of the differences there. I'm using Tor as sort of the gold standard because most everybody is familiar with Tor. Everybody kind of knows what Tor is, how Tor works. It's kind of well known inside of the community, so we'll use that as our gold standard. So the very first link here is the I2P, I2P project proper. And you can go there at getitp.net. And I'm going to just start this off by letting you know they have fantastic documentation. Their documentation on their project, on the things that they're working on, on threats, on analysis, all of that, they have some of the best documentation that I've seen so far, and it's all available directly through their site. Can't talk that up enough. The next thing that I want to let you all know is they had a 2015 I2P Con. It's a convention. I have linked a playlist that you can go to if you would like to sit down and actually watch their convention. Uh, there's a ton of explanation about things that they're doing, stuff that they're wanting to do with the project, where they're going, direction. Uh, they talk a little bit about some of the threats that they're seeing. It was actually very interesting. However, uh, they said that they were planning a 2016 I2P con. Never happened. Okay, so the 2015 one is the only one that ever occurred, and nothing ever else came out of it. And I don't think after having done some pretty extensive searching, I didn't see any, I, any other I2P-centric conventions, as far as I know, okay? In addition to that, full disclosure, I took this talk, just as I did with Freenet, and I went to the I2P people and I handed them the talk. And I asked them in the I2P dev chat room on IRC, can you guys please take a look at this thing? Look at it and make sure that everything is factual, that I'm not saying anything, that could be considered a lie or a mistake or anything like that. And my only request was just confirm that nothing but facts are being stated here. Uh, they did not solicit for any changes due to reputation, any concerns about anything that I was saying, nothing like that. Okay, so they reviewed it. They had a few things that they wanted me to talk about and ask. Uh, I actually took one of the sections here and you can go on here and you can take a look and there's the chat log right there where they gave me a little bit more information about the network, corrected me, and then uh, did ask that uh, I let randos know that if you would like, in your spare time, you could contribute to this project. So it's all right there. You can see exactly what was said and how it was stated, okay? So full disclosure, they didn't ask me to change anything because they were worried, but they had some things that they wanted me to, to discuss there. So let's start with how does I2P work? What is the difference and what is this thing actually doing? So they have some pretty, I don't want to say they're complicated, but they have a very set structure to how things are done. And probably the most important part of this is going to be the tunnels and how the tunnels work. Because tunnels within the I2P network are unidirectional. So you have a connection from your system out to another system, and data will flow from your system to that system and never return through that tunnel. However, eventually, and we'll talk about this using the network database and how these connections are made, data has to flow back. So another tunnel is created where information then floods into your system. But it's unidirectional, and this is extremely important. So Let's talk about the strict separation between software, which is known as the router, and the endpoint, which is the destination. Because the act of running I2P is not a secret, usually. You're not going to hide this. People can look, and they will see that you're using I2P. It's what is traversing the network that they will not know about. So if you're running I2P at home, somebody knows that you're running I2P at home. And it's not just you, OK? So let's make that clear. If you're concerned about whether or not this is going to be a privacy concern, well, somebody knows you're running I2P. They may not be able to see what's happening on that traffic. So 
the activity that you're participating in, whether it's IRC, whether it's uh, surfing the internet through HTTP, if you're transferring files through FTP, whatever it is that you're doing through the I2P network, that is the thing that is actively hidden, okay? In addition to that, the destination for your traffic can be considered actively hidden. So who you're communicating with and what you're doing, but the fact that you're doing it in a secure manner, that is not hidden. Again, the second most important concept as far as they're concerned is the tunnel, but uh, that tunnel is the connection being made from one computer to another. It's just unidirectional tunneling between your system and another system. And uh, a final piece to that is you have outbound tunnels where traffic leaves, inbound tunnels where traffic comes in, and that's it. Now the first computer, which is sort of like, um, I guess a way of describing this would be like, if you're talking in medical terms, we usually do proximal and distal to the heart. So it's either closest to the heart or it's furthest from the heart. Uh, they use the very same thing for your system. So the first computer, the client, or the server, whichever one that you're discussing, is going to be referred to as the gateway. So if you see the word gateway, they're talking about not the systems in between, but the systems that are at the endpoints, okay? So they do use a network database, and we're gonna talk about some of the network flaw, the, the flaws that can potentially affect that network database, okay? Because obviously if you have a centralized point of failure like a database, potentially you can target that in order to cause problems with the network. So we'll get to that when we start getting down into some of the flaws. But uh, the concept of the network database is very important to I2P. That net database, and I do use NET and then capital D and then a lowercase b because when you're looking through their notes, that is what you will see, okay? That's used to transfer all of the metadata about the network. And the information being shared is the router info and all of the lease sets. And that router info will give the routers the data necessary for reaching a particular system, okay? That data is going to include transport addresses, public keys, and additional but when I use the word additional, they did not mention what that additional data was, okay? So their notes simply stated that you're going to have information necessary to be able to communicate with those, and they gave a specific list and then included additional but unmentioned data about the network. So the lease set will provide the information necessary for cont contacting a particular destination, and the leases, plural, because we'll get into garlic routing and all of that here in a second, Within the lease set, we'll specify tunnel gateways and work as a map for reaching a destination. Now, this area right here, up at the top, uh, I quoted this because I felt that straight off of their stuff, this was a great way of describing things. So you have inbound gateways for a tunnel that allows reaching a specific destination. We're gonna have the time when a tunnel expires because the tunnels do expire, they don't stay open forever, okay? You're not gonna just make a, are we having technical difficulties? Okay, so you're not going to just have a single connection that opens and then stays open until you're done using it. Eventually there will be a timeout and then that connection will collapse. And then you have a pair of public keys to be able to encrypt messages. So we can send those through the tunnel and reach the destination. The routers will send router info to the net database directly while the lease sets are sent through outbound tunnels only. And this is done because a lease set must be sent anonymously or it will correlate the router with the lease set. So you can't follow the traffic in that manner to figure out where information is being sent. Again, if you click here and you open up that word function, you can see, and I, I archive a lot of stuff. I use archive.is, but uh, what I recommend is if you open it and it actually looks interesting to you, go to the I2P page and actually open it for the latest version. But uh, again, they're notes are fantastic. All of the information describing exactly what they're doing, how things operate, all of that stuff, just excellent, excellent documentation. Can't praise them enough for it. And they actually mention it during uh, that I2P con. They talk about how, what ended up happening with the project was, they had an original developer, which we'll get to here in a second, but that original developer disappeared. And after that original developer disappeared, they uh, 
began to work on the project. Then they had a massive server crash, nearly lost everything, had some huge problems with I2P as a project, like the actual project as a whole, and then eventually shut the whole thing down for X number of months and did nothing but document everything. Built total documentation for the entire project and then span the, document, the, span the project back up for contributions again. So there was a freeze on this entire project for a short while. So let's start with the install. Now everybody here knows that I prefer to run my stuff remotely. I don't normally install Freenet, I2P, Tor, anything like that internally to my network or to my systems. Now everybody here knows about Prism. We've all read the Prism documentation. We all know what kind of things queue off to get people like the NSA, CIA, all those people interested in what it is that you're doing. Sign up for Linux Journal, guess what? They're going to come take a peek at you. Be running I2P on your internal network, guess what? They're going to come take a peek at you. Whatever it is that you're doing, those are the things that trigger them to investigate, okay? They start looking at those items. So, first order of business, go review the code. Just look at it. Take a look at the commits, look at some of the releases, the branches, who are the contributors, who are the main contributors. I always urge people, before you ever get on the horse, go ahead and do a full inspection of it, okay? We all have GitHub accounts. Everybody here knows how to use GitHub. Anybody at home, if you don't know how to use GitHub, go up to the YouTube search, type in how to use GitHub. Uh, they talk about what prerequisites that you need. They discuss everything that you need to know about this code, okay? Now, probably sound like a broken record for those of you who have been here for some of my previous talks, but the most important thing that you can possibly do is familiarize yourself with what's going on with a project before you start using that project because that makes you prepared to be able to identify if there are any problems in the future. So, after you've looked at the tool and you've done your inspection, the next thing that you're going to want to do, as far as my recommendations are concerned, is acquire hosting, external hosting from your network. Uh, again, I don't get paid for shilling Scaleways, but I like Scaleways. I'm happy with them. They treat me very well, and I have several systems with them, so I point people towards them. Now, their systems are located in France and Amsterdam. Five eyes, okay? France and Amsterdam are not outside of the number of countries that we can go to and knock on the door and be like, hey, hook us up. Keep that in mind, okay? In the Freenet talk, I talked about some of the other countries that are considered outside of that, but now you're opening up a whole different kind of worms. In addition to that, for those of you who are not aware, they're currently working on repealing laws and changing laws uh, so that the dragnet style of capturing your information and your data will soon supposedly be legal, okay? So, AKA, if somebody is doing an investigation on a foreign national and they're using the full force of the intelligence agencies to do so, and you, for whatever reason, are either using a server that they're using or whatever, just because you're a US citizen, that protection will not extend if they decide to start pulling data off of that system, okay? The laws are currently being worked so that they don't have to worry about your status as a US citizen when doing those kinds of investigations. They can pivot to pull your data as well, okay? So keep that in mind. As these things change, depending on where you host and do all of these different things, it could potentially change whatever your concerns are, okay? The very next thing is SSH into the system. I shouldn't have to say it, but I'm going to say it anyways. Make sure you start your firewall, UFW, whatever it is that you want to do. Secure the system. Make sure that you're using SSH keys. Do all the things necessary to secure that system. Once you've done that, then the next thing that you can do is begin installing software. Uh, I have some instructions here for using wget. That right there uh, will pull whatever at the time of right now is the latest version of I2P. So you can wget that. I don't recommend doing that. If you're watching this on video, make sure that you actually go to the I2P webpage, wget the latest file, and then once you've done so, you can just run the jar. It's very similar to what you do uh, when dealing with Freenet, 
So if you've done any of the Freenet stuff, almost exactly the same way. Uh, it's going to work very similar for I2P. Then I recommend using SSH tunneling. Okay, so you're going to SSH into the box. You're going to sw use switch L as in Lima, and you're going to set your ports. Now the default port for I2P is going to be 7657 unless you've made any changes within the configuration files. But if you're just working through this from top to bottom, that's what you're going to need to connect to in order to gain access to the actual I2P configuration page. So that will be your control page. In addition to that, if you want to be able to surf over to I2P sites, then you're going to need to make available to yourself port 4444. And that opens up HTTP. Now, Freenet, I2P, a little bit different here. I2P, or the Invisible Internet Project, as it once was called, was designed originally for making IRC invisible and secure. Okay, Internet Relay Chat. Everybody here familiar with Internet Relay Chat, IRC? It was the cool thing before Discord? Okay. Well, if you haven't used it yet, see me after class. <laughs> Get you set up. Uh, so that's where they began. So I2P actually has multiple ports that you can connect to and make available to yourself in order to make different products available. Again, IRC, FTP, HTTP. There's a laundry list of different um, applications that you can use for connecting to this. Now, let's think about that for a second. When I talk to my students, I always tell them the two most important things that you need to be thinking about is how does this thing work and how does this hurt me? When you're using something like I2P, guess what? Your footprint is going to be very different than my footprint. Me, whenever I connect to Freenet or I connect to I2P, I use eLinks. eLinks is a command line interface based browser that doesn't support things like Flash. It doesn't support things like JavaScript doesn't support any of that stuff. And there's a reason for that, which we'll get to here in a little bit when we start talking about some of these intelligence agencies that are literally breaking into I2P. Uh, so I use that. Somebody else may be using Chrome. They might be using Firefox. They might be using any number of other tools and running their stuff through I2P. That changes your threat footprint. So there is no one size fits all security whenever you're using these systems, okay? They're just not, which when we get to Tor, that's sort of what Tor is trying to fix when they give you the Tor browser. Everybody sets on a even plane. Everybody has the exact same vulnerabilities available to themselves. Everybody's using the exact same browser. That's what they want, whereas with this system, you can use other things. So once we have opened up that port, we can then just go to our browser and surf on over to localhost 7657. Uh, of importance, if you open that port 4444 and set up your proxy to face towards 4444 on your browser, the system will actually not allow you to surf your configuration files. You can't actually see that config page as long as you're connected to that proxy. So there's security reasons for that, but it's something to keep in mind. So if you set everything up initially, and then it isn't working the way that you expected, well, then the problem may be that you're connected to that proxy. As soon as you're done with that, though, the next thing that you're going to want to do is go to your configuration, choose your network, and get the port. It's a UDP port that should be open for that box. Once you do that, it makes network traffic flow easier. And uh, something that's very, very cool with I2P is if you look on the left-hand side of the configuration page, uh, it has what amounts to a very detailed hand-holdy explanation for any issues that it finds with the system and exactly what you need to do, do to go fix it. It'll tell you what ports to open. It will tell you what to work on. It'll tell you any number of things about your network as it tries to figure out the best way to move traffic around. Okay, Some people might like that. Some people might not like that. And there, obviously, you can think of reasons for that. But setting up I2P, super simple. Once you've got everything set up, just like essentially Freenet, the thing is running, and it's just off. 
Uh, they normally tell you on the notes that you need about 24 hours for it to become effective because of all the information that needs to transfer. Uh, mine was up and running pretty well within about two hours. Okay, So your mileage may vary. Um, opening up the ports on the firewall. For some people that may be a difficult task. If you're using UFW, it's real easy. Uh, your final goal in this configuration is just to get the network icon on that left side of the screen to say OK and to get some green stars. So if you see any red on the left hand side of the screen as you're working on this thing, click on it and it'll explain to you what you need to fix to make it work. It's super verbose. Um, it has a ton of recommendations on how to make the network run better, uh, make things more available for others. And all of the documentation, again, can't say it enough, is super excellent. And they provide tons of hand-holding for new users. Once you get to that point where you can connect, it's very easy to just follow the steps. So who made this? Let's talk about the product itself. Who created this? I want you all to see this, because this is their list of who actually created it. And I've actually talked to this uh, Zulu, Zulu, Zulu guy right here, the ZZZ. We had a conversation within uh, IRC, uh, PSI right there, Psy. Had a conversation with him in IRC. And you can see that if you surf further up and go look at my chat log. But uh, they're all very accessible, but very private, which you could expect that. Uh, with the Freenet people, many of them are creating YouTube videos. Uh, you can see their faces. You know who these people are. It's very easy to become what amounts to very personal with the Freenet people, whereas with the I2P folks, not so much. Uh, they are available in IRC. They're very talkative. I didn't have any problems with them not communicating with me. However, they are very, very big on their privacy. No pictures of them or anything like that up. In addition to that, we really need to talk about who the original creator of I2P was. So while they're taking their privacy very serious, the original creator, the person who first started this project, was a user who went by the name of J Random. So J Random began this development back in 2003. And if you remember, 2003 is right around when like Tor started. So they began development at right around the same time. However, shortly after, J Random vanished, just disappeared. And at that point, they lost all of the keys to the servers. They lost the ability to update their web pages. They lost connection to what amounts to everything. And they had to piece the entire project back together after that user disappeared overnight. Now, they were able to salvage it, and the I2P project has continued, but while I was doing my, I'm going to use the word investigation here, learning about the project, talking to people in IRC and things like that, there was a user on there who decided to state with unsubstantiated claims, no evidence here, that uh, Jay Random was a Chinese national who, while working on the I2P project, was eventually arrested uh, and is currently being held. And in addition to that, uh, the claim was made that J Random should be coming up for parole sometime in 2019. It's an interesting rumor, but I include it for completeness since it was in the chat logs. So what does I2P do? Well, a lot, actually. It began as the Invisible Internet Project, and it was originally designed to allow communications over IRC. So if you were using IRC, uh, I'm not sure, again, if you're not familiar with IRC, IRC is fairly insecure. Uh, it's very easy to get information about other users who are connected to a server. You can get IP addresses. There's a lot of insecurity within IRC just from the ground up. And the idea here was to provide a level of anonymous communication for those individuals who were using IRC. Eventually, it the project itself began to evolve. And as it evolved, they began to increase and add more and more items that could connect to the project. Um, they started with Usenet. They started adding email. Then they went to file sharing. And then web hosting and telnet. 
So there's a whole bunch of different things that you can use to connect to I2P as long as your system supports it, okay? I2P really functions more as a network protocol than it does as just a singular project. Whereas with Tor, you go and you download Tor, you grab a Tor browser, and then you make a connection, and then essentially that is what you're doing. You're living within their ecosystem. I2P works more as like a doorway. They give you a door that you can send information through securely, and then anybody can connect to it and use the tools that they've designed to use that. Good things and bad things about that, okay? So I have an excellent uh, PDF here. And again, I really enjoy going out and finding actual documentation that was produced by schools and things like that. So I offer that here to you all to review. But if you would like to learn about the intricacies of onion routing, there's a very, very good introduction to it that I post there uh, that was provided. And then in addition to that, we'll go over it ourselves. So they use the term garlic. But one of the problems with this project that they admit to is that when you use the term garlic, they didn't use it for the same thing every time. So if you entered the project early on in the early years, they used garlic for one specific set of things. And then as the project evolved, the word garlic also evolved. So really, we need to talk about three things. And those are the layered encryption, the bundling of message together, which is probably what most of us are familiar with. When we hear garlic, we're probably thinking about that bundling of messages. And then also the El Gamal AES encryption. They also use the word garlic for that. So in order to understand the garlic routing, first we have to understand that onion routing consists of building the tunnels, which we talked about, through a series of peers, and then using that tunnel, unidirectional, right? And each hop is going to decrypt a piece of the message before passing the rest on. So, therefore, it works a lot like peeling an onion. I hand the onion to you, you peel off a piece, you look at it, it gives you the information that you need to pass it on to the next person, you hand that onion off, and then it continues. However, you don't have the ability to see what the next person is going to see. You can't decrypt that. So, each one of those different layers are stripped until the data ends up at whatever the destination was intended. So messages are encrypted for each hop of the journey. Onion routing and garlic routing are very similar, if not the same, in concept, with the first difference being that the multiple messages are bundled together in I2P. Again, in an attempt to better anonymize the user. And while any number of messages can be contained in an I2P clove, there is a, a limit that they use. So I2P is unidirectional, meaning all of that information can only travel in a single direction. It's encrypted. And as it travels, each user is going to pull off a little bit of information before passing on that message. So, I2P uses garlic routing, bundling, and encryption in three different places. Bundling and routing through the tunnels, that layered encryption, for determining the success or failure of end-to-end -end message delivery, which again is part of the bundling, so they need to know whether or not the message actually got there. And then for publishing some network database entries, dampening the probability of a successful traffic analysis attack. And I have another link which takes you to even more garlic-related uh, documentation, all provided by I2P, where they break down some of the issues that they ran into. And in addition to that, it also explains uh, why they sort of have this disparate explanation for everything. Uh, again, I have a PDF. I try to mark the PDFs so you know it's a PDF because I know some people are concerned about downloading PDFs. So I do have a PDF on I2P attacks. So if you want to see some of the proof of concepts and some of the things that they're using, we can look at that if you're so inclined. Now the very first thing that I want to talk about is Tails. Tails is an amnesic Linux distribution. The idea being that if you're using Tails, it's usually installed on a thumb drive. You plug it into a computer, 
and when you're done, you disconnect it, and it doesn't write anything to the hardware, okay, in theory. Um, I2P is bundled within Tails. However, it is not activated by default. Tails, in general, uses Tor, which is activated by default. They bundle I2P. So for many people who are stumbling onto the I2P project, where they got into it is through Tails. Now there's a little company called Exodus Intelligence. And they made a huge stink. And what they ended up doing is they discovered a vulnerability within I2P or a vulnerability that you could access when using I2P. Upon locating that vulnerability, uh, they essentially went out to Twitter and told everybody, we're super awesome, we're super cool guys, we're so neat, we broke into I2P and we broke into Tails and we can de-anonymize everybody and that's how awesome we are. Sort of like a press release to drum up business for themselves. At which point there was a huge freak out from the security community who demanded that they release the information about the zero day that they had and they said, well we have even better zero days so we don't care and they released information about the vulnerability that they found within I2P and Tails. Okay? And it, Spoilers, we'll get to it in a second, but it's JavaScript, okay? So using JavaScript, they're able to execute an attack on the browser that is bundled in with the system that most people are going to use because they're downloading Tails, they're turning on I2P, and then they're using the browser that's located within that amnesic uh, Linux distribution to access I2P. So they figured out how to do a browser exploit. Okay, it happens. So, of course, they make up this huge thing, make it look super, super hardcore, tell everybody that they can demonstrate this, unmask all the anonymous users of the Tails operating system as long as they turn on I2P. Turns into a big deal, and then we find out it's JavaScript. Uh, of note, was after all of this had occurred and they released the information and they told everybody about the uh, situation. Well, at that point, they went on to start telling people, well, if you think we're the only ones in the business who are attacking your privacy, we're not. And there's other people who have even better zero days that we know about and so on and so forth. And they essentially did the, well, we're not so bad because somebody out there is worse. And we know that. But you might not know that. But now you do, so it's okay. I'm not sure if that was a good business decision. I don't know. I'm not sure what they were trying to do, but this is their web page. And what they do here is they advertise that they can find zero days, in days, metadata. They have their advertisement and they let everybody know that if you want to be able to break into stuff, these are the people to contact. So they're still in business. So obviously they must be making money. And in addition to that, I also provide a link to Tails. And eventually, here we're going to do a full class on Tails. So we'll have a full discussion about Tails, how it works, why people use it, so on and so forth. Um, but if you want to visit their web page, you can do so. Now, again, Freenet, I2P, so far, both of them, really good about talking about vulnerabilities. They don't shy from it. They don't try to hide any of this stuff. The moment people start saying, hey, we found a vulnerability inside of your tool, they discuss it. And they discuss it pretty publicly. And I like that. Uh, I have a link to their list of threats. And I'm going to show it. But they actually have a full threat model. And they talk about all the different ways that they know of that you can attack I2P. So, Brute force attacks, timing attacks, intersection attacks, denial of service, tagging, partitioning, predecessor, harvesting, traffic identification and analysis, uh, Sybil attacks, if we remember Freenet. Freenet also had issues with Sybil attacks. 
uh, buddy, exhaust, buddy exhausting attacks, even attacks on cryptography. So are people targeting the cryptography being used and can they find any kind of vulnerabilities in it? The list is pretty, expensive, pretty extensive and not only is it an extensive list, but they do a really excellent job of describing each one of those threats. And they attempt to also show where it was used or who discovered it or papers and they link. So if you're interested in I2P and you want a better understanding, this is a fantastic place to go get started so you can start seeing exactly what it is that they're doing in terms of investigating all of the tools that people are using against their network. So those high level discussions, that scores a lot of points for me. Uh, they also provide opinions on the attacks themselves. So they try to let you know how effective it is or exactly how many resources they think that it would require for somebody to ex uh, execute that attack. So if it seems like something that would be pretty inexpensive, they mention it. Or if it seems like something that would require a state actor, they mention that as well. They're very transparent. But let's get real, OK? Operating systems suck, all right? And no matter what operating system you're using, you should probably just consider it compromised. No amount of anonymous software is going to protect you from some of the vulnerabilities that have already been baked into your hardware and into your software. And I'm going to stand by the statement that I always give. If they want you, they have you, OK? They have ways of getting into different systems. They can monitor your network. They can monitor your traffic. There's all kinds of different stuff. So let's start with Linux, because I love Linux. Wouldn't be here if I didn't. But uh, I'm going to preface this like you would hear if we were sitting in a briefing somewhere. Due to my training and experience, I do not believe that it is possible for Linus Torvalds to have refused the American government if they did seriously proposition him for a back door into the kernel. Okay? Because of things that I have seen, I'm going to say right now that if the U.S. government comes to you and says, hey, we need access to this stuff, you don't get to do what he did. So I'm going to come down here to the video and we're going to play it. Yeah, so this question, have, have any of you been approached by the U.S. for a back door? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, no. No. So. Not that I can talk about it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So in this video, what I'm trying to show you here is this gentleman over here on the left asks, has anybody ever approached you for a back door into the kernel? Linus Torvalds laughs and he goes, no. Just like that. Shakes his head up and down for yes and then says the word no and then they all giggle and laugh about it because it's funny, right? Now, I've asked before and I'll ask again because I see some new faces out here. Everybody knows that you can go review the Linux kernel, correct? Everybody knows that you can go to a web page and you can see the Linux kernel. Who here can raise their hand and safely say that they have read every line of code and performed a code review on the Linux kernel? Anybody? No? Me? No? Anybody at home? It would be awesome if you have. Let me know about it because I'd love to hear about that. Uh, no single person has complete understanding or control over the kernel, okay? It's just, it's not possible. And if you've looked at some of the things that we have discovered as far as exploits go, you can do some really cool stuff that you would never be able to identify as an exploit, okay? We saw what happened with Windows, right? You send a handful of packets over and over to Windows, and even though it keeps failing out and nothing's happening, eventually you're actually writing to memory and then eventually you start executing code and you have remote code execution on a Windows box even though you never log into the Windows box. That's a really cool thing to be able to do, right? Uh, too many intricacies, too many things going on, too many moving parts. Nobody has control over that, 
okay? And it doesn't have to look like it. Like, I don't expect for them to ever find a backdoor in the Linux kernel that has a big ass comment that says, NSA 2014 created this code right here, send it a couple of packets, and eventually you're going to break in and have remote code execution, blah, blah, blah. Like, that's not what we're going to find, okay? That's not how it's done. So, maybe it's not my place to chastise, but when you run a project that is that important, joking about being propositioned for backdoors in your product, probably in bad taste and not conducive in building confidence in the Linux product. Okay? Getting up and saying these things in public, probably don't want to do that. Okay? What about Windows? So, this one's pretty interesting because Microsoft is known for being pretty cozy with the NSA, with the federal government. Again, when we get to the PRISM stuff, I've got the PRISM slides available here. You can see in big letters it says, NSA, Microsoft, best friends forever. Like, they have all of those slides that have already been released. So, just to back it up with facts, though, let's start up talking about um, way back in 1999. So, all the way back in 1999, Windows had a situation where they began adding a small section to the code where they have SSL keys, uh, and those SSL keys and those signing keys and all of this data was marked under NSA key. And then eventually, the source code leaks, and somebody poking around found all of these NSA keys. Now, that individual, decided to write up a big paper and go public with this and question it. And again, I have all of this information here where it even goes so far as not only did they find the NSA keys, then they find another third key that nobody could identify and nobody wanted to lay claim to. So who knows whose key that was. Uh, this guy takes all this information, bundles it up, goes out, starts telling people about it. At that point, Microsoft actually reaches out to them and says, no, it's totally cool. Everybody uses the words NSA key because it, it just makes sense when you're programming. Uh, and then in addition to that, they said, look, uh, how about we do a phone interview and we'll sit down and you can ask me any questions you want about this and I'll answer all of them. At which point the guy says, sure. Now, this is where the story kind of breaks into two places, okay? So you have this individual who's doing this conversation and this talk who claims that upon starting the interview with Microsoft, began asking questions, and then the conversation ended. And he was told to go away. Now Microsoft claims that they were answering all of the questions and that he became increasingly confrontational, at which point his questioning became circular, and then they decided to end the interview because they felt that it was going nowhere. Now you have two stories, and as far as I can tell, and from my searching, this conversation was not recorded, so we can't really see what was really going on or hear it, but um, they didn't get along. And my understanding also is that Microsoft put the kibosh on that guy as a security researcher and didn't let him play anymore, or at least attempted to. Let's also go to Germany because documents leaked from Germany. And they were warning people. Is everybody familiar with the fact that Germany has been in the news multiple times over the past few years because they've been attempting to move towards Linux? They've instituted Linux and then they've had to remove Linux and then they've reinstituted Linux and they keep going back and forth. Okay. This may shed some light on that. Uh, they had a whole bunch of documentation that they created that essentially told everybody if you're doing anything important and you're doing it under Windows, it's being funneled immediately to the US government. Which other documents leaked that were our documents, which is essentially said that we were spying on all of our allies. So it doesn't sound like their concerns were unfounded. 
just on account of the fact that their documentation sort of lined up with our documentation in terms of who's watching who. Now, of course, this is all, I mean, it's, it's government. And maybe I'm, I don't know, maybe I'm the wrong person to be saying this. I don't know. But it should be expected, okay? Like, for whatever you believe or whatever stuff that you have in your mind, believe me, different countries spy on each other. It goes back for a million billion years. For as long as there have been people in two huts that people owned, people want to know what other people are doing. Like, it's just, it's going to happen. And it'll probably happen far into the future, okay? Whether we like it or not. So they get upset in Germany about trusted computing. Now, the idea behind trusted computing is, is that your hardware and your software sort of mesh to allow them to function and for you to only run specific code. Now, the conspiracy theory being that if we move towards trusted computing and we start moving towards these hardware-based controls for the software that we run, eventually that will push like Linux out. Linux won't be able to run on hardware anymore because they won't be able to get the signatures. Now, obviously some of that stuff is changing as Microsoft is really moving towards the embrace, enhance, and then extinguish with Linux. Now you can take Windows 10 and you can install Linux and then you have a, like a Debian backend under Windows 10. And so why install Linux when you can just install Windows and run Linux inside of Windows in a native manner? No. But, of course, that was then and this is now, so things are changing. But your digital rights management, your uh, trusted computing, all of these items, they're designed to allow you to only run certain code, okay? Now, Germany doesn't like it. They don't want to use it. And they warn each other that it's a bad idea, okay? But that kind of moves us over into, well, your hardware sucks too. Uh, let's start with Intel, and then we'll move over to AMD, and we can actually touch. I didn't add the links because I don't have them in there, but I actually have some information on my phone about the stuff that's going on with uh, AMD and this huge 13-point leak thing that they've got going on. But uh, this one is really good. And... If you do nothing else, I really do recommend going to this chip proof of concept for analog attacks. And of course, it's got a lot of um, buzzword, like scare the normies kind of stuff in this. Like it's designed to use words that are super scary, like demonically. Don't, don't allow that to take your mind off of what you're actually seeing here. A few minutes ago, I asked who checked every line of the kernel. Nobody raised their hand. Well, guess what? You have billions of transistors. You have billions of st stuff inside of a chip, right? So if we were to take like an i7 and we were to go pick it up and put it under a microscope, it's just covered in things. Well, the idea being here that you can take and you can make some surreptitious connections within that chip that nobody will ever notice and they'll never see it. But if you start running certain electrical currents through the chip, eventually those changes that you made in there will connect in a very specific way to begin running code. Okay? So the next part of this is, is after they have remote code execution through the chip and through the hardware and they gain access to everything, as soon as they're done and it stops running electricity through the chip, they restart the system, whatever. All of those connections are severed, and you actually can't go back and figure out what they did. There's, no, there's nothing to follow unless you know exactly what they were running. And the way that they describe it in here is that you could set it up to where it takes days, days of sending very specific commands to that chip until it finally does what you want. But that means that a security researcher going in blind will never locate this. They're never going to find it. They're never going to find the problem. And in addition to that, they're probably never, ever, ever going to be able to reproduce what you did unless they have detailed instructions on exactly what you did. Okay? 
it's actually very, very interesting, and there's a ton of stuff in there that is worth reading. So if for nothing else, you should definitely take a moment to read that. But that takes us to Intel Management and the Intel Management Engine and all of their flaws. Uh, Intel's had some missteps. There's been passwords hard-coded. There's been all kinds of problems where you can take over servers remotely. You can gain access to be able to write directly to the BIOS. You can do all kinds of crazy stuff with Intel machines because eventually the idea that we're trying to move towards, if you're not already aware of this, is eventually you're going to have memory on your home computer, but the vast majority of processing and all of your storage is going to be held somewhere in the cloud. Okay, that's uh, anybody here heard about Optane yet? Optane memory? Okay, so Optane memory being the idea that you kind of work as a cache. You have a cache within your home, and then everything else that you're doing is stored on an off site server. And what does that do? Well, it makes it really easy to be able to look through all your stuff and make sure that you're behaving. Um, Microsoft actually has a program where every single image that goes into a Windows computer, uh, and this, of course, this information is several years old, so perhaps it's changed, but for every image that goes into a Windows computer, what they do is they shoot a um, hash of that image, and then they send it home. And they gather those hashes, and they're inspecting those hashes to see if it matches up with child pornography. So for every image that ends up on your computer, they shoot a hash of it and send it out to, to check it. And then in addition to that, because sometimes people will sit there and they'll edit the images or they will um, add like watermarks and things like that and in an attempt to check the hash, it actually checks in layers. And so they can see, okay, well you added a watermark down here, but the rest of the image lines up with another image that we have and then they can start an investigation from there. Okay? So everything that Microsoft is doing and Intel and all of these groups, eventually the, the core sole idea there is to take away all that ability for you to have anything at home and just move it to their servers so they can do all those checks, so they can run all of that stuff. And I don't want anybody to think, well, he's saying that like it's a bad thing. What if we need to check all that stuff? Some people are going to be A-OK -okay with running every single image that they have through somebody else's server. Some people are not. And some people are doing it because it's illegal. And some people are doing it because they just care about privacy. Uh, I'm one of the people who cares about privacy. I like my stuff to be my stuff. And if I'm doing something wrong and somebody finds that, fine, OK. Same with anybody else. But the idea that every single person is guilty until found innocent, that I disagree with. So going back to Intel and all of their stuff that they're doing, uh, eventually we move towards, let's take a step back here. Anybody here remember the Commodore 64? I've heard of. You've heard, heard of it? Fantastic. I'm glad to hear that. So. Let me give you a little bit of history about the Commodore 64 and how this thing functioned, okay? So you could sit down at a Commodore 64 and you could type in any program you want and you can poke and you can do all of this stuff and no matter what you did to that system, you could do all kinds of crazy things. You'd mess up your screen, anything. But all you had to do was reach down and press a button and the system would reboot and you were immediately back to a clean system. So there wasn't really a way to sit there and poison that Commodore 64. Because no matter what you did, at the end of the day, all you had to do was restart the system and you were right back up and running. Okay? You couldn't go in and run software to automatically write to those chips. Okay? You couldn't uh, do essentially any of these things that we have started to do to our hardware now. Nowadays, if you want to write to the BIOS, all you need to do is go grab a program and you can start writing to the BIOS and you can write at a low level directly to your hardware and you can make everything that you did persistent. Whereas that persistence simply didn't exist back then. And that's kind of the best explanation that I can give between what we had then and what we have today. Where today we can write things that will live in resident memory forever. 
once you infect that system, if they are able to access that piece of the system, after that, the hardware's ruined because you can never get it out. That's where we're at right now, okay? And no amount of hitting that button on the side of the computer or pressing that thing on the top, none of that is going to save you from any of these issues that we're having, okay? But it's all part of moving towards remote management. It's supposed to make your life easier, right? Uh, does anybody here know the name of the operating system that is actually running at a low level on all of your Intel stuff? Starts with an M? Linux. 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 So there is a operating system that runs at a low level and then another operating system that runs on top of that that you're interacting with, but that low level operating system is essentially uh, working as a man in the middle to get, grab anything that you're doing on your system and can simply send it out anywhere that it wants to. Okay, and for a while that was kind of like a conspiracy theory. People brought that up and people were like, no, oh, that's impossible. I remember several years ago when I was discussing that and I was told that that's not happening. Well, now we know that it is and now we know that it is a flaw and that there are issues with it and it allows access to stuff that we didn't want them to have access to. So I'm kind of vindicated in the sense that everything's on fire, but I just pointed out the kindling early. Uh, each one of these flaws that are coming out, many of them really aren't flaws. They're features that people can use in a negative manner. Okay? These aren't, these aren't like, oh man, somebody accidentally gave remote access to the BIOS. I can't believe somebody did that. We got to turn this off. No, it, the idea was I want you to implement remote access to the BIOS and to be able to write this. And somebody else was like, oh, this is actually available as a feature. I'm going to start using it for bad. So hardware sucks, right? Now let's talk about this AMD thing. Because probably everybody's heard about it right now. And uh, one of the first things I want to talk about is this guy, Yuri Farkas. And I may be saying this wrong, but he's the vice president of R&D at CTS Labs. Uh, of note is that uh, he was a security researcher for Israeli Defense Forces. Okay, And this is important because if you actually sit down and you start pulling up all of the former members of the Israeli Defense Force who are on this team, essentially it adds up to everybody. Chief Technology Office, Chief Financial Officer, the Vice President, all of these people. All of the research and development for most of the Intel chips are done in Israel. So the people who have the closest access to being able to figure this stuff out would be those folks. Now, who else is doing that? Guess what? AMD is doing that. So a lot of their research and development is performed over there in Israel. Israeli Defense Forces have access to that stuff, and they're able to develop these zero days right there on site. Okay. Now, if you actually go and you read the documentation, and I don't want this to sound like I'm trying to defend AMD because I'm not, because all of this stuff sucks. It's all a huge dumpster fire, and I'm unhappy with everything. We shouldn't even be at this point, but we are. So let's just... Put it out there. Uh, if you go and you read the documentation for this flaw or set of flaws, they even mention, we want everybody to know that AMD stock should be worth zero dollars because of the flaws that we've discovered. Like that's within the documentation. People don't say that unless they're shorting that stock. So I'm going to make a prediction for all of you and somebody at the SEC is probably going to be doing an investigation on this group, which is not going to go anywhere because they're all outside of the United States and none of them have a connection to the United States. So I'd be highly shocked or surprised if anything comes out of this. But what it sounds like is they had a whole long list of flaws that are probably at this point worthless or well known within the security researcher community. They wrote a paper put those flaws out there, told everybody to go short or dump their AMD stock, and they were probably running some options to be able to pick that stock up on the low. Okay, That's my opinion of what's most likely happening here. Uh, now, I think 
when I checked it this morning, AMD stock was down a couple of bucks. And from what I was reading on a whole bunch of different web pages, a whole lot of people are already discussing how this shouldn't be going on. But um, keep that in mind. We're at the point where most of our stock trading and our business and all of these things are done using algorithms. So we're going to see a continuance of people being able to manipulate the market through fear, just like they used to do back in the day. But now it's tech stocks using security issues. Go look up what Linus Torvald said about this. Uh, I think he called people whores. And then um, uh, that uh, Linus Tech Tips guy, he jumped in here, used essentially the exact same language. A whole bunch of people are very upset with the fact that Intel had a whole bunch of flaws. They had close to six months to work on those flaws. AMD, whole bunch of flaws, no difference. But they had less than 24 hours to come up with whatever it was that they wanted to say. Uh, you should look into that, OK? You really should. So now let's talk about some pri privacy threats. We've already talked about how the hardware sucks, the software sucks, everything sucks. Well, let's talk about the privacy. So there are seven companies globally that provide the backbone to the internet. Think that's a big number? Not really. I don't think so. Seven companies, OK? Now, we have agreements similar to uh, PRISM, similar to PRISM being the agreements that we have with companies. And then we have agreements with like five eyes, nine eyes, so on and so forth. So we have intergovernmental agreements. And then we have company agreements, OK? It's pretty easy to spy on people in this day and age. Everything's connected. Everything's always online. We got tons of stuff that's out in the cloud. It's very easy to be able to look at whatever it is that people are doing. And you only have seven companies that you got to deal with, all right? And most of these companies outside of the United States are extremely well connected to the government, OK? So 40% of all web hosting on the entire planet is hosted within the United States. And then 18% of it is hosted out in Germany. Germany, super hooked up with us on Five Eyes, all right? Now, a negligible 7% of hosting is done in China, and then there's a random set of other countries. Uh, it's not difficult for us to gather information about folks. It is not difficult to get a warrant within the United States to gain access to 40% of all of the web hosting within the entire planet. Um, we're going to talk about this when we get to tour, but I also want to talk about it with the I2P stuff. World's biggest child pornography site was run by who? Australian police. The second largest child pornography site in the entire planet got taken over and ran by who? The FBI. Every single major um, distribution point under Tor has been knocked over. Okay? And they're repeatedly being knocked over. So that would tell you that there's somebody who knows exactly how to go find stuff that's on tour and de-anonymize those people. Because every single one of those groups are being hid and being taken over. And they're being run by the government. And we've already talked about this and the, the concepts like re-victimization and all of that and the stuff that gets me really going. Uh, so I'm not going to touch on those right now. I have links to PRISM. I have links to all of this stuff. Uh, this is Prism Break, where they try to talk about some of the tools that are available. Again, when you're talking about the fact that there's only seven companies globally, and obviously large, like child pornography distribution sites and stuff like that, would probably be major targets for anybody. There's not going to be very many governments within this entire globe who's going to look at something like that and be like, well, we're not going to participate in that. That's not going to happen, OK? You can also go on Wikipedia and look at all the PRISM slides. I added that in there, but it's super slow. I'm just going to warn you right now, if you try to go to the Wikipedia part and start pulling those things open and you actually start to read them, it will bring your computer to a crashing hold. Uh, so what am I really trying to tell you? Let me open these two slides and I'll tell you. Surprise, surprise. 
This one right here is on Antichrist's girl. And the, the, the wording I'm going to use is just sniff the wire. You only have so many wires. You've got seven companies. Seven companies that you need to be able to make some sort of intergovernmental agreement with to be able to gain access to pretty much the entire internet over the entire world. Okay, so if you want to sit down and find out what people are doing, it's pretty simple. What did I say at the very beginning of this talk? I2P hides, hides who you're talking to and what you're doing, but not that you're running it. So if you're running a massive Tor uh, onion site, how difficult do you think it would be for somebody to be able to look at their network and figure out that there's a ton of Tor traffic headed to this server in and out, over and over and over, and be able to identify all of that. Well, is it a onion site? Is it a, uh, let's say, uh, exit node? You can actually sit down and start looking for all of that, and you can figure it out pretty quick. These networks aren't huge. They really aren't. In the grand scheme of things, when you look at I2P, when you look at Freenet, when you look at Tor, there aren't a ton of users. There really aren't. It's pretty easy at this point to look at it because it sticks out like a sore thumb. It really does. So this is the anti-crisis girls. This is NSA and GCHQ surveillance. Um, this is how they were able to figure out the WikiLeaks people, who's supporting them, who's talking to them, who's discussing things. They just sat there and sniffed the wire until they figured this out. And then I talk about the internet backbone. Uh, you should read about the internet on Wikipedia. You should read about these companies that are actually working on this stuff, okay? Uh, again, really it's seven major companies. There's smaller companies, but anybody here familiar with the web hosting industry? A lot of it is reselling. You have a handful of what I'm gonna call tier one providers, and then you have a whole bunch of people who just resell whatever it is that they're selling. And that's kind of how web hosting works. There's only a handful of companies that are actually running like the, the buildings that have the servers in them. And then it's a whole bunch of people who just kind of piggyback off of that. It's different layers of that, okay? So now that we are like super depressed and everybody's like, oh my God, the whole sh everything's ruined. <laughs> There's no reason to continue, I'm done. Now let's get into content, <laughs> right? <laughs> now that everybody wants a beer, now we can start with the actual content. <laughs> um, I2P uses I2P sites. You'll also hear them used as EEP sites, E-E-P-S-I-T-E-S, -E -E and that's very similar to how you're gonna find an Onion site, okay? Uh, when we were talking about using port 4444 higher up, that's your proxy. If you want to be able to surf to an EEP site, you have to create a proxy to that port, and then you can surf to the EEP sites. They won't load if you just make that SSH connection, that, that, um, that link. You have to actually use that as your proxy for your traffic. Now, if you want to do the same thing with IRC, so on and so forth, whenever you're reading your documentation, you will see what ports are necessary. Okay, so this TLD, this top level domain of .i2p, that's going to denote the websites that are available only from the I2P network. These are their hidden sites, okay? They have the exact same thing available through I2P that is available through Tor, whereas Tor does it through .onion, they're doing it through .i2p. Uh, so, what should we do? We should find out how they're doing this. Now, if you're using the default settings and you decide to throw up an I2P site, what do you have access to? The Eclipse Jetty web server. This is what is powering most of these I2P sites, this tool right here. So let's say that we were a bunch of enterprising hackers and we wanted to figure out what's going on with this. What's one of the first things we should be doing? Pulling CVEs, right, vulnerabilities for Jetty. That's what you're gonna wanna start looking for because who, what are they gonna be using mostly? They're gonna be using mostly the Jetty server that's already been set up for them and then we're going to go look and see what are some of the vulnerabilities that have already been found for this, and then that's where you start. You start on the shoulders of giants, right? If everybody knows that that window up there is really easy to break with a rock, and it's been broken multiple times, well then maybe that's the window we should start looking at, right? 
So that's where you begin. Uh, in addition to that, I give you a link to the project home for Jetty. Now this, this right here is where we get to the part where I say, I don't like this about I2P, and I don't like this about Tor, but this, this is the eternal argument. Everybody remembers Gopher, right? Gopher was the best protocol ever made. Gopher was awesome. But Gopher didn't provide us with the ability to spy on users. It didn't provide us with that ability to run JavaScript and to push code to somebody's browser and to do all of the things that HTTP allowed. You couldn't do ads. You couldn't track people. There was a lot of things that Gopher didn't provide. But HTTP provided. So who won out? HTTP. Why? Because you could make money with it. You could make money on advertisements. You could make money by allowing people to write to databases and then pull information from those databases in live, real time. There was a ton of stuff going on with HTTP that you simply could not do with Gopher. We're on that argument again. Freenet gives you HTML and some CSS and not a whole lot else. And it protects you because there's no JavaScript, there's no Flash, there's no Web 2.0, there's none of that stuff inside of Freenet. Freenet isn't making as big of a market share as I2P is. Why? Because I2P provides you with the ability to run JavaScript, to access PHP, MySQL, to access all of the stuff that a regular web server would allow. But guess what? That also includes all of the vulnerabilities. So when you're shrinking your footprint, for vulnerabilities with Freenet and you're using Freenet for communication and you're protecting yourself, well, you can immediately pivot and you can use I2P and now you have access to all of the rope that you need to hang yourself. That you simply wouldn't have access to that rope whenever you're working under Freenet. Now, what does that mean? That means that there is a higher barrier to being an effective I2P user than there is with Freenet. With Freenet, I hop onto eLinks, I grab my port, and I SSH in, and then the next thing I know, I'm running around on Freenet, and I'm having a great time, and it's real easy, and I can see all kinds of really cool stuff. They've got really neat web pages on Freenet that have to do with things like uh, people creating their own uh, audio dramas. I found, like, comics. I found all kinds of stuff that's really neat on Freenet. Under I2P, they have a ton of cryptocurrency stuff. They have a lot of business stuff. Um, Essentially, all of the Silk Road and all of that stuff has migrated from Tor over to I2P. So remember how we did that class? And in that class, I showed you where people were going to go buy heroin and to buy Narcan, to buy all of those drugs and all the things that they were doing. And we went on kind of like a safari through the shittier parts of the internet. Well, all of that has migrated from Tor over to I2P because they have the tools. They have JavaScript, they have PHP, they have MySQL, they have all of that. Now, I'm real big on minimizing your vulnerability footprint. I think it's interesting that if you read Tor documentation, they tell you that they leave JavaScript on to defend you. If you read their, they read their documentation and it says, we leave JavaScript on because by turning it off, it changes your footprint and people know you're different. So shouldn't we just turn it off from the beginning for everybody and just warn everybody that JavaScript sucks and that it's not good? So this is Tails. And they decided to tell you about the security hole that was found in I2P. And they warn you. You know, you can set an administration password to protect yourself. You can purge I2P and just get rid of I2P totally. That's part of their, their methodology. You want to protect yourself from this, just get rid of I2P. But if you look, it says, or just disable JavaScript. Because the entire vulnerability that they found was a JavaScript vulnerability that was attacking through the browser. So why have JavaScript? Well, because it makes it easier to have that Web 2.0 stuff. Uh, I saw a really good rant that I really enjoyed where it talked about how we have multi-billion transistor CPUs running millions and millions and millions of lines of code that is 
running through systems that cost us thousands of dollars, all so that we can ship post on our favorite image board. Okay, so we're funneling down this pipe of tons and tons and tons of branches, and every single one of those branches is potentially a, a landmine that we can stumble on so that we can post an image and put some text next to it. That's where we're at. Your news sites are bigger than Doom, like Shooty Doom. That, you're, you go to news web pages and you're downloading more to load a single page than we would have downloaded to play the entire game of Doom a few years ago. JavaScript, Flash, uh, just a ton of, ton of code that's running on your system that really isn't necessary. And it, maybe I'm jaded, but when you have a, a company that comes out and says, well, we found a zero day and we're super hardcore and we can take anybody on, and then you find out, well, yeah, you exploited the browser with JavaScript, but everybody knows that JavaScript sucks. So, and maybe, maybe somebody here is sitting on a zero day for e-links and I don't even know it. I don't know. But what we can do right now is I'm going to go through some of the answers here and then we'll open up for questions and uh, we'll go through the conclusion and things like that and then we can discuss some of this other stuff. But uh, going back to our original stuff, let me go over the questions one more time. We want to be able to identify what I2P is. By the time we were done here, I wanted to make sure that you at least knew what I2P was and where you could go find it and read about it. Identify at least one reason why we should block JavaScript. I think I gave you a whole bunch of reasons, but it, at the very minimum, you have at least one. You should be able to explain how I2P works. You should know that there's two tunnels. Those tunnels are unidirectional. There's garlic routing. Uh, it is different, but very similar to Tor. And then explain how I2P is different than Tor. Well, they have multiple message inside of Cloves, right? When they pass data on, they can send multiple messages out, whereas with Tor, it's a single message that's being routed. So let's go back to some of this stuff. I2P is a peer-to-peer -peer platform that appears to regularly tout a strong connection to cryptocurrency and dark markets. If you look down at the bottom, whenever you load this thing up, it's got links to all kinds of markets and cryptocurrencies and all kinds of different stuff that they're doing. That's sort of the, the first thing that goes straight into your face. Uh, I also gave some more JavaScript exploits here. Uh, this is one of the CVEs for Mozilla Firefox from all the way back in 2013. Uh, again, remote code execution through JavaScript. Uh, and it was actually pretty simple for them to be able to do this. And then I also give you a link to the NIST. And I did this as an archive, but you can go up here and use the links where I give you additional information. So they just do not properly handle on ready state change events in conjunction with page reloading, which allows remote attackers to cause a denial of service because you can remotely crash the application, or potentially you can execute arbitrary code via a crafted website that triggers an attempt to execute data at an unmapped memory location. So you can start hitting memory that you're not supposed to in an attempt to run code, okay? And of course, there's all kinds of uh, information about the impact. Now, I like how it says it's network exploitable, but the victim must voluntarily interact with the attack mechanism. That's a really fancy way of saying you have to surf the internet. People do that, okay? So yes, you have to click ABC, right? Always be clicking. We just always click, no matter what it is. But uh, you don't need to authenticate. You don't need access to root. Uh, you don't need any of that stuff. You just need somebody to click. And that's JavaScript, okay? And I don't care how many times we make changes or how many times we go in and we update JavaScript and we make changes to jQuery and so on and so forth. I don't care about any of that because no matter what, if you're able to force somebody's browser to execute code, potentially there's a hole in there somewhere. And it just takes time to be able to find it. 
So what is I2P really doing? Well, it functions by allowing users to anonymously share files, browse, chat, and more through the use of the I2P protocol. You can do a ton of stuff with I2P. Uh, I know we get, we're, we're doing this sort of clickbaity thing where I was like, Freenet is pretty good, I2P is okay, Tor is not really good. Like we're trying to be, get more people to come in and actually listen to this stuff because I feel like we tell it like it is. But um, the reality is when I look at this, I do see that competition again between HTML and Gopher. You have Freenet, which is pretty secure, does a pretty good job but they take a lot from you. You're not running databases. You're not running uh, JavaScript. You're not running any of that stuff. They give you some text, which for the most part, that's how I digest the internet. I like text. Give, I want to read it, and I prefer to read it. I2P is not like that. They're trying to give you that Web 2.0 experience while exposing you to all of the flaws that are inherent in Web 2.0 in an attempt to anonymize those things. I don't think that it works that way. Not that it doesn't work that way, because it does. Obviously, they're running the protocol and stuff. But it doesn't work that way in terms of you can't have access to all those tools and then still expect yourself to be private. And then finally, Tor uses onion routing while ITP uses garlic routing. Tor is more focused on accessing servers outside the Tor network. A lot of their stuff is very focused on the exit node. Uh, while ITP attempts to minimize connections to the clear net. Um, they do mention during their talk that ITP considers itself extremely centralized with what amounts to only a single exit node for the entire network. Everybody else should be working within the, the ITP network. So I'm going to read this conclusion, and then we'll open up for questions. I2P is designed as a primarily internal network with the intention to make minimal bridging to the clear net possible. I2P is an anonymous network layer and is designed to facilitate the use of supporting software. Again, your footprint is going to be different than mine. I use eLinks. You use GNU IceCat. Your vulnerability is going to be different than mine. So. That means you must use I2P in conjunction with other tools in order to attain anonymous communication. You're going to rely on a web browser. You're going to rely on these tunnels. You're going to have an IRC client. Your IRC client is going to be different than mine. I've got WeChat. What do you have? Uh, your file sharing applications are going to be different than the ones that I'm using. But each one of these items has to be designed to use the I2P protocol while also being cognizant of not leaking your information out to the internet. So also we have to remember that every single application that you use increases the possibility that you are vulnerable. It's just inherent. If you pick an application, then you're vulnerable to something. And that is the trade-off that we make. So I do believe that the I2P project has many positive aspects. And no project is perfect. I really talk up Freenet because I really like it and I wish everybody would just go back to Gopher and text. Like I would love that. Let's all go back to that. But we can't. That, that genie's already out of the bottle. Their documentation, second to none. They have excellent documentation, tons and tons of hand holding. It's very easy to get involved in this project, okay? But I do feel that their decision to allow JavaScript, PHP, and other tools does increase their ability to garner favor with that Web 2.0 crowd, the businesses, the people who want to be able to use this to conduct anonymous business online. This is a tool for that. But it detracts from the security of the tool due to the increased vulnerability footprint inherent in those technologies. Go look up WordPress I2P. And there are people who are deploying WordPress sites under I2P and filling those sites up with all kinds of stuff and leaving themselves open to WordPress attacks, but they're using I2P to defend themselves. It, it seems like an odd trade-off to me to make that decision. Uh, but I don't know. That's their use case, not mine, right? I2P is extremely popular with the alternative currency crowd. And it's easy to see that I2P provides an excellent set of tools for interacting with that technology. It really does. 
However, you can also find documentation online that has claimed to be leaked by the government that says that they've already broken I2P as a cryptocurrency tool and that they've de-anonymized all of these crypto tool users. So whether that's true or not, or if that's scaremongering or whatever it is, I don't know, but there's those claims being made. So while there are vulnerabilities within the technology, and there are also obviously a host of people who are toiling away in an attempt to disrupt or harm the network, I do feel that the I2P community has been working diligently to provide an acceptable product that I feel is worth using for anyone who does not need to rely on that tool for their life. There's a ton of fun stuff you can do there. I like Freenet, I just told you. I get on there and I'm, I'm listening to these crazy radio dramas that somebody's making in their bedroom that I'm really enjoying. But I'm not going to jump onto this tool and use it if it potentially means somebody's going to put a bullet in the back of my head. Okay? So what are my final recommendations? Just like always, get yourself a PGP key, get something so that you can identify who you are. Use any number of tools that we've discussed in here. I don't care what it is, pick one, but make sure that you have something that, so that you can encrypt things, decrypt things, have your own secure communication without relying on a whole ton of other stuff. Use Linux if at all possible. I know that I said that Linux is potentially vulnerable and we've got Linus Torvalds up there laughing about it and stuff like that, but it's the best we've got. Contribute to a privacy enhancing project, whatever it is. I do recommend Freenet, but pick one. Uh, again, if you go all the way up to the top and you look inside of the chat, they're looking for people. They need help. And as far as I can tell, they seem to be genuinely interested in helping people. They seem genuinely interested in creating a good product. And if you're interested in working on those kind of projects or this is something that you want to contribute to, find something to contribute to and do it. Okay? Uh, I do recommend that you develop relationships and build that dark net. We talked about it in the free net course where you have to have friends, which sucks because a lot of us don't have friends. <laughs> but uh, if you don't, start trying to look into it because it's the best way to actually build your secure network is to know who you're talking to. Uh, understand how that works. And then finally, just contribute to something. It, no matter what it is, find yourself an open source project, make your own, do whatever it is that you need to do, but contribute somewhere, if at all possible. I can't urge it enough, because there's a lot of us who sit around and we complain and we're angry and we want to know why things are broken and why they're not working and why so many terrible things are happening out in the world, but then we're not doing anything. So if at all possible, take the time to actually sit down and contribute in some way, if you can, okay? So I guess, I'm going to go ahead and close it, and then if anybody wants to catch me before we shut down, we can do that. But uh, I'd like to give my thanks to all of you for coming out. I really appreciate it, and I hope this was of some benefit to all of you.